Welcome to Alexandria, where history, mythology, and cultures come alive through audiobooks. Please subscribe, like, and comment to support us. Also, subtitles are available in over 70 languages. Just click the settings icon and choose your preferred language to fully experience the wonders of our stories. Welcome to the final chapter of our Alexander the Great audiobook series on Alexandria. Chapter 12, titled Alexander's End, brings us to the dramatic conclusion of the life of one of history's most enigmatic figures. This chapter spans the final years of Alexander's reign, capturing his relentless drive for conquest, his ultimate reach to the banks of the Indus River, and the poignant decline that led to his unexpected demise in 326 to 319 BC. This chapter is not only a narrative of the end of a legendary life, but also a reflection on the legacy left behind by Alexander the Great. How did his death shape the future of the vast territories he conquered? What were the immediate and long-term effects of his rule on the regions he touched? Join us as we unravel these questions and more in the concluding segment of our series. Chapter 12, Alexander's End, B.C. 326 to 319. After the events in the previous chapter, Alexander continued his expeditions and conquests in Asia for two or three years. He had many different adventures during this time, but we won't go into detail about them here. He traveled to India, reaching the banks of the Indus River. Unsatisfied with this, he prepared to cross the Indus and continue his journey to the Ganges River. However, his soldiers opposed this plan. They were scared by the stories they heard about the Indian armies, with elephants carrying castles on their backs and soldiers armed with unfamiliar and unknown weapons. These rumors, along with the soldiers' desire to stay closer to their homeland, caused a near mutiny in the army. Eventually, Alexander, realizing the growing extent of insubordination, called his officers to his tent and gathered the entire army. He spoke to them, telling them about everything they had done before. He praised their bravery and determination and tried to encourage them to keep going. They listened quietly, and no one said anything in response. After this serious moment, there was a lot of excitement in the room. The army admired their commander, despite his flaws and mistakes. They were very hesitant to challenge his authority, but they no longer had the same trust in his abilities and goodness that they had earlier in his career. Finally, one of the soldiers approached the king and spoke to him in the following manner. We still love and support you, sir. Our dedication and loyalty remain unchanged. We are willing to risk our lives and go wherever you guide us. Still, we kindly request you to consider the situation we are in. We have done everything we could for you. We have traveled across oceans and continents. We have explored the farthest corners of the world, and now you are contemplating conquering another by venturing into uncharted territories, even unknown to the natives themselves. This idea might sound brave and determined, but it goes beyond our capabilities, especially considering how weak we are. Just look at these horrifying faces and bodies filled with wounds and scars. Think about how many of us there were when we started this journey with you, and now see how few of us are left. Those who have managed to escape many difficulties and dangers do not have the courage or strength to continue following you. They all want to return to their country and homes and spend the rest of their lives enjoying the rewards of their hard work. Please understand and forgive them for these natural desires. The soldiers expressing these feelings further solidified them. Alexander was very troubled and upset. If a small portion of an army is disloyal, it can be dealt with through strong actions. However, when the determination to resist is widespread, it is futile for any commander, regardless of their authority and absolute nature, to try to oppose it. Alexander, though, was very unwilling to give in. He stayed in his tent for two days, feeling disappointed and upset. As a result, he gave up his plans for more conquest and headed back west. 
He had many different experiences along the way and faced many dangers, often acting recklessly and without a good reason. Once, during an attack on a small town, he took a scaling ladder and went up with the troops. However, he did this in such a reckless and thoughtless manner that his ladder broke. While everyone else retreated, he was left alone on the wall. He then descended into the town and was quickly surrounded by enemies. His friends raised their ladders once more and continued their search for him, determined to rescue him. Some stood by his side and protected him, while others managed to open a small gate, allowing the rest of the army to enter. Thanks to this, Alexander was saved. However, when they brought him out of the city, there was a three-foot-long arrow lodged in his side, piercing through his armor. The surgeons carefully removed the wooden part of the arrow and then enlarged the wound to take out the barbed point. The soldiers were angry that Alexander put himself in danger and forced them to risk their lives to save him. The wound was almost deadly, causing extreme exhaustion due to blood loss. However, he recovered within a few weeks. Alexander's habits of excessive drinking and indulgence in vices were constantly growing. Not only did he partake in these excesses himself, but he also encouraged others to do so. He would even reward those who could drink the most at his banquets. On one of these occasions, the man who conquered drank, it is said, a lot of wine, after which he felt very sick for three days and then died, and more than 40 others, present at the same party, died because they drank too much. Alexander went back to Babylon. His friend Hephaestion was with him, joining him in all the bad habits he had developed. Alexander started to distance himself from his old Macedonian friends and became closer to his Persian companions. He married Statira, the eldest daughter of Darius, and entrusted the youngest daughter to Hephaestion. He also supported other Macedonian officers marrying Persian maidens whenever possible. In simple terms, he appeared determined to combine his true nature and behavior with the femininity, extravagance, and immorality of the Eastern world, which he had initially regarded with disdain. Alexander's arrival in Babylon after his campaigns in India was a grand and magnificent event. Ambassadors and princes from various nations had gathered to greet and celebrate his return. Elaborate arrangements were made for processions, shows, parades, and spectacles to honor him. The entire country was very excited, and they made very expensive preparations to welcome him. They wanted to give him a reception that was fitting for someone who was considered the conqueror and ruler of the world, and who was believed to be the son of a god. When Alexander reached the city, he was greeted by a group of Chaldean astrologers. These astrologers were philosophers who claimed to predict human events using the movements of the stars. The movements of the stars were closely observed in ancient times, particularly in the eastern countries, by the shepherds. These shepherds would spend their summer nights outdoors, keeping watch over their flocks. These shepherds noticed that most of the stars stayed in the same positions relative to each other. They rose in the east and set in the west, but their positions relative to each other didn't change. However, there were a few stars that moved around among the others in a strange and unpredictable way. They called these stars the Wanderers, or in their language, the planets, and they observed their mysterious movements with great curiosity and wonder. They believed that these changes were somehow related to human matters, and they tried to predict from them the events, whether good or bad, that would happen to humanity. Whenever a bright object in the sky or a shadow covering the sun or moon happened, People believed it meant something bad was going to happen. The study of how the stars move and look, in order to predict what will happen to humans, was called astrology. The astrologers came in a grand and serious procession to meet Alexander during his journey. They told him that they had found clear evidence in the stars that if he entered Babylon, he would be putting his life at risk. So they asked him not to go any closer and to select a different city as his capital. Alexander was very confused by this announcement. 
His mind, weakened by too much indulgence and excessive behavior, was easily influenced by irrational fears. It wasn't just the bad effects of engaging in bad habits on his mind that caused this result. Additionally, there was the moral influence of knowing he was guilty. Guilt instills fear in people, amplifying real dangers and making the mind susceptible to various imaginary fears. Alexander was very worried when he heard what the astrologer said. He stopped marching and started thinking about what to do. Eventually, the Greek philosophers came to him and talked to him about it. They convinced him that astrology was not something he should believe in. The Greeks didn't believe in astrology. Instead, they predicted future events by observing bird flights and dissecting sacrificial animals. Eventually, Alexander's concerns were eased, and he decided to go into the city. He moved forward with his entire army, entering with a lot of show and grandeur. But once the initial excitement wore off, he started feeling worried, troubled, and unhappy. Hephaestion, Alexander's close friend, died while they were on their way to Babylon. He passed away due to illnesses caused by excessive indulgence and bad habits. Alexander was deeply saddened by his death. It made him very sad and gloomy. He felt this way for a while, thinking about the event and what it meant. He decided that when he got to Babylon, he would have a big funeral to honor Hephaestion's memory. He then sent orders to all the cities and kingdoms nearby and gathered a huge amount of money for this purpose. He had a section of the city wall demolished to make space for a grand building. This building was built very large and with detailed designs. The building was decorated with many ship fronts and statues that Alexander won in battles. There were also columns, sculptures, and golden decorations. On the roof, there were images of sirens that could sing sad songs using a hidden mechanism. According to historians of that time, the cost of this building, along with the events, shows, and performances related to its dedication, was reported to be an amount that, when calculated, is approximately equivalent to $10 million. However, there were still some limits to Alexander's extravagance and foolishness. In Greece, there was a mountain called Mount Athos, where someone claimed it could be carved and shaped into the shape of a man, possibly lying down. There was a city on a slope of the mountain, and a small river came down on the other side. The artist who thought of this amazing sculpture said that he would shape the figure in a way that the city would be in one hand, and the river would flow out from the other. Alexander heard the proposal. The name Mount Athos reminded him of Xerxes, a former king of Persia, who tried to make a road through the rocks on Mount Athos when invading Greece. Xerxes didn't succeed, but left the unfinished work as a reminder of the attempt and the failure. Alexander decided not to create the sculpture. He believed that Mount Athos was already a monument to the foolishness of one king and didn't want to contribute to it further. After the funeral of Hephaestion, Alexander's mood became gloomy again. However, he still had some of his previous energy left and started making grand plans to improve Babylon. He started carrying out some of these plans. In summary, his time was spent in unpredictable cycles, determination and drive to create huge plans one day, and complete surrender to indulgence and immoral behavior the next. It was sad to see his previous greatness of spirit still fighting, although weaker and weaker, as it was gradually overwhelmed by the unstoppable effects of excessive drinking and wrongdoing. The scene finally ended abruptly in the following way. Once, after a night of drinking and partying, the guests suggested that instead of ending the gathering, they should start a second banquet right after the first. Alexander, who was already partially drunk, enthusiastically agreed to the suggestion. They quickly gathered for the event, with a total of 20 people present. Alexander, to demonstrate that he had not yet reached his limit, started to toast each person in the group individually. Then he drank to all of them at once. There was a really big cup, called the Bowl of Hercules, which he now asked for, and after filling it completely, he drank it all to the well-being of one of the people there, 
a Macedonian named Proteus. This achievement was celebrated by the company. He then requested another full bowl and drank it all. After completing the task, he became weak and fell to the floor. They took him back to his palace. He got a strong fever and the doctors did everything they could to make it better. When he started to feel a bit better, Alexander woke up and tried to convince himself that he would get better. He started giving orders for the army and his ships, as if focusing on power and empire would save him from the obvious path to death. He was determined to survive. However, despite his efforts to be strong and determined, he realized that his strength was fading rapidly. His vital powers had greatly weakened, and he knew that they wouldn't last much longer. He decided that he had to die. He took off his signet ring, which showed that he believed everything was finished. He gave the ring to one of his friends who was next to his bed. After I'm gone, he said, take my body to the temple of Jupiter Ammon and bury it there. The generals who were with him came to his bedside and one by one kissed his hand. As they saw him about to say goodbye to them forever, their old love for him returned. He was asked about his desired successor for his empire. To the most deserving, he said. By this answer, he probably meant that he was too weak and tired to think about such matters. He knew, probably, that it was useless for him to attempt to control the government of his empire after his death. In fact, he mentioned that he expected some unusual funeral games to occur as a result of the decisions made about these matters. Shortly after, he passed away. The palaces of Babylon were filled with mourning when the prince died, and there were long and bitter arguments about who would succeed him. Alexander's goal was not to establish stable and well-organized governments in the countries he conquered, but to promote order, peace, and industry among people, and to bring structure and organization to human affairs to leave the world in a better state than he found it. In this regard, his actions are very different from Washington's. Washington wanted to develop and improve organizations that would function successfully on their own without his constant involvement. He took joy in seeing the institutions he created and safeguarded operate independently, rather than seeking personal power through direct control over public affairs. Alexander, however, was always focused on expanding and strengthening his own personal power. He was the center of everything, he wanted to make himself even more powerful. He never considered the well-being of the countries he had conquered, nor did he take any steps to prevent the chaos and civil wars that he knew would inevitably occur across his vast empire once his rule was over. The result was as might have been foreseen. The vast territory that Alexander conquered was torn apart by brutal and prolonged civil wars for many years after his death. Every general and governor fought to keep the power that was left in their hands after Alexander's death, trying to defend it against the others. Therefore, the destruction and suffering caused by these conquests lasted for a long time as Europe and Asia slowly and painfully recovered. However, when Alexander died, his generals quickly gathered and tried to appoint someone to take immediate command. They argued about this for a week. Alexander didn't have a rightful heir, and he refused to name a successor before he died. He had multiple wives, but one named Roxana gave birth to a son after he died. This son was later chosen as his successor. However, in the meantime, a relative named Aridaeus was selected by the generals to take charge. The choice of Aridaeus was a kind of agreement. He had no skills or abilities whatsoever and was chosen by the others precisely because of that. Each one believed that if someone as foolish as Aridaeus was the nominal king, they could easily take control of the real power themselves. Aridaeus agreed to the appointment, but he never succeeded in becoming king in anything other than name. Meanwhile, as news of Alexander's death spread throughout the empire, it had different effects on different people and powers depending on their personal feelings towards Alexander. Some mourned and lamented his death, while others who had admired his greatness and the magnificent things he had done but hadn't personally suffered the consequences felt saddened by the news. Others, 
whose lives had been ruined and whose loved ones were destroyed as a result of his victories, were happy that the person who had caused so much pain to others had finally faced the consequences of their actions. It was expected that Sisagambes, the mother of Darius who was grieving and widowed, would be one of those who would be most joyful at the death of the conqueror. However, history tells us that she instead mourned deeply and was unable to find comfort for a long time. Alexander had actually been a loyal and kind friend to her, despite being a relentless enemy to her son. He always treated her with great respect and kindness, fulfilling all her needs and ensuring her comfort and happiness. She had slowly come to think of him and love him like a son. In fact, he always called her mother. When she found out he was no longer there, she felt like her last protector on earth was gone. Her life had been filled with suffering and sadness, and this final tragedy caused her to wither away, constantly agitated and distressed. She lost all desire for food and refused to eat, like others who are going through great mental pain. Her friends and attendants offered her food, but she refused. Eventually, she passed away. Some people said she didn't eat and starved herself to death. However, it was more likely that she died from sadness and hopelessness because she was left alone and without any friends in her later years, rather than hunger. In stark contrast to the sad scene in the palace of Sisagambes, there was a display of wild and joyful celebration in the streets and public places of Athens when they received news of the death of the powerful Macedonian king. The Athenian city-state, along with other states in southern Greece, had reluctantly accepted the rule of Macedonia. They had fought against Philip and Alexander. Although Alexander's brutal revenge on Thebes had temporarily silenced their opposition, they were never truly defeated. Demosthenes, the influential orator who had spoken out against the Macedonian kings, had been exiled, and any public displays of discontent were suppressed. The discontent and hostility still existed, as strong as ever, and were ready to erupt again, with even greater violence, once the fearsome power of Alexander was no longer a threat. So when the rumor reached Athens, initially just a rumor, that Alexander had died in Babylon, the entire city was filled with tumultuous joy. The people gathered in public areas and celebrated and spoke passionately to each other with great joy. They wanted to declare their independence and immediately start a war against Macedon. However, some of the older and wiser counselors were more composed and calm. They suggested a short delay to verify the accuracy of the news. Phocian, a respected statesman, tried to calm the people's excitement. Let's not be hasty, he said. We have plenty of time. If Alexander is truly deceased today, he will still be deceased tomorrow and the following day. This gives us ample time to make thoughtful and careful decisions. Just as true as this perspective was, it contained too much criticism and mockery to significantly impact its intended audience. The people were determined to go to war. They dispatched representatives to all the states of the Peloponnesus to form an alliance, both for defense and offense, against Macedon. They brought Demosthenes back from exile and implemented all the required military preparations to establish and safeguard their independence. The consequences of all this would have been very serious if the rumor of Alexander's death had been false. Fortunately, for Demosthenes and the Athenians, it was soon confirmed. The return of Demosthenes to the city was like a victorious conqueror's triumphal entry. At the time he was called back, he was on the island of Aegina, which is about 40 miles southwest of Athens, in one of the gulfs of the Aegean Sea. They sent a public galley to pick him up and bring him to the land. It was a galley with three banks of oars and was decorated in a way that showed respect to an important guest. Athens is located a bit far from the sea and has a small port called the Piraeus on the shore. There's a long, straight avenue that connects the port and the city. Demosthenes arrived at the Piraeus by ship. All the civil and religious leaders of the city went to the port in a big procession to greet and welcome the exile when he arrived. 
many people from the city also followed along to see the event and join in the celebration. Meanwhile, they were also making grand preparations for Alexander's funeral, with a lot of magnificence and splendor. It took two years for them to finish. First, the body was embalmed using the Egyptian and Chaldean art. Then, it was placed in a sarcophagus to be taken to its final resting place. As a reminder, Alexander had instructed that it should be brought to the temple of Jupiter Ammon in the Egyptian oasis, where he had been declared the son of a god. It might be hard to believe that someone as intelligent as him would actually believe in such a ridiculous superstition as the tale of his divine birth. So, we can assume that he instructed this to ensure that his burial site would strengthen the belief of his extraordinary nature in the minds of people. In any case, these were his instructions, and the authorities in Babylon, who remained in power after his death, were ready to carry them out. It was a long trip. To transport a body from Babylon to the eastern frontiers of Egypt, a distance of a thousand miles, in a funeral procession, shortly after the death, and as soon as the preparations were done, was maybe one of the most impressive burial plans ever made. It has a similar event to when Napoleon's body was moved from St. Helena to Paris, although this was not really a burial, but a transfer. Alexander's procession was a simple burial march, going from the palace where he died to the proper cemetery, a journey of a thousand miles, it is true, but all within his own lands. The significance of it came from the grand scale on which everything related to the great leader was carried out. However, it was essentially just a movement from his home to the burial ground on his own properties. A really big and fancy carriage was made to carry the body. The descriptions of how rich and beautiful this vehicle was are almost unbelievable. The spokes and handles of the wheels were covered in gold, and the parts of the axles that could be seen outside at the centers of the wheels were decorated with large golden ornaments. The wheels and axle trees were very big and far apart. They supported a platform or floor for the carriage that was 12 feet wide and 18 feet long. On this platform, there was a beautiful pavilion with ionic columns. It was decorated with purple and gold, both inside and outside. The inside was like a partly open apartment, filled with beautiful gems and precious stones. The area of 12 feet by 18 made a decently sized room, with enough space for everything needed inside. There was a raised throne with steps and a platform. The throne was intricately carved and decorated with gold. It was empty, but there were crowns representing the nations Alexander had ruled hanging on them. At the bottom of the throne was a coffin, reportedly made of solid gold. The coffin contained the body and a large amount of expensive spices and perfumes, which filled the air with their scent. The weapons that Alexander carried were displayed in front, along with the coffin and the throne. Surrounding the carriage were sculptured figures called basso relievos, showing Alexander and his military companions. There were columns from Macedonia, squadrons from Persia, elephants from India, cavalry troops, and other symbols representing the greatness and power of the deceased hero. Around the pavilion, there was also a border of golden lace with bells attached, which rang sadly as the carriage moved. A long line of 64 mules, arranged in sets of four, pulled this heavy cart. These mules were chosen for their large size and strength. They were beautifully adorned with gold-mounted collars and harnesses, adorned with precious stones. Before the parade started from Babylon, a group of workers and builders went ahead to fix the roads, strengthen the bridges, and clear the obstacles along the entire route where the procession was going to pass. Finally, when everything was ready, the grand procession started to move and went out through the gates of Babylon. It's impossible to put into words the massive crowds of people who gathered to watch it leave and who lined the route as it slowly made its way from city to city. Despite the impressive show, the body never made it to its planned destination. Ptolemy, the ruler of Egypt after Alexander's empire was divided, sent a large group of soldiers to meet the funeral procession as it entered Egypt. 
he decided for some unknown reason that the body should be buried in the city of Alexandria. It was put there, and a big monument was built on top. They say this monument stood for 1,500 years, but there's nothing left of it now. The city of Alexandria, however, is the conqueror's true monument, the greatest and best, perhaps, that any conqueror ever left behind. It is a monument that time will not destroy. Its location and nature, as Alexander foresaw, ensure its everlasting existence. Alexander earned the title The Great because he possessed exceptional abilities that set him apart from others. As we close the final chapter, Alexander's End, in our captivating Alexander the Great audiobook series, we reflect on the extraordinary saga that unfolded. Through the pages of history, we witnessed the rise and fall of a figure whose ambition knew no bounds and whose legacy continues to influence the world. Chapter 12 brings us to the culmination of Alexander's astonishing journey, a narrative rich with triumph and tragedy. We traveled alongside Alexander to the furthest reaches of his empire, witnessed his struggles and victories, and finally, his unexpected end. This chapter not only concludes the story of a legendary conqueror, but also invites us to ponder the complexities of power, legacy, and the human spirit. Thank you for joining us on this historical adventure in Alexandria. If this journey through the past has captivated you, stay connected with our channel. At Alexandria, we are committed to bringing more stories like this to life, exploring the depths of history and its timeless tales. Remember to subscribe for more engaging content, like and share this video to support our endeavors and be a part of our community that cherishes the richness of our past. As we conclude this series, we invite you to stay with us for more enlightening and inspiring journeys through history. The story of Alexander the Great may have ended, but the legacy of his life continues to echo through time here in Alexandria.